Thank you, Dr. Axelrod. I'm going, I'm going to talk with you this evening about cell phones, the hidden truth. And I have to, I have a confession. When I started looking into this issue, I owned three cell phones. I still, now I own two. And I thought that people who were concerned about cell phones uh, were not very credible because many of those expressing concerns about the issue, frankly, are not scientists. And I thought that the whole issue really was one of those things that people get carried away about. Uh, but then my first grandchild was born. And like um, many of you, I was thrilled with how smart and brilliant he was. And at age eight months, he was fascinated with cell phones. And I thought it was really great that he could push numbers or buttons and get the phone to do things. And I thought, this is such an intelligent child. And then I began to look at what we knew or didn't know, or in the United States have preferred not to think about when it comes to cell phone radiation. So I ended up, at the end of the Secret History of the War on Cancer, writing about the world's largest study ever done on cell phone radiation in a population, the Danish Cancer Society study. And that study, of course, finds no risk associated with cell phones and brain cancer, as in fact most studies find no risk associated with cell phones and brain cancer. That study had defined a user as someone who made one call a week for six months. So it looked at users compared to non-users, and uh, the average use of a cell phone had been about five years, and concluded that cell phones were safe, and the headline made it around the world, and it was that headline that made me think cell phones were safe as well. Well, I'm going to show you why, in fact, we don't have uh, such a clean bill of health for cell phones today, and also tell you that there are simple things you can do to protect yourself. Uh, we ha are not telling you to stop using cell phones, because that would be ridiculous. We're telling you to use them in a more sensible manner, and I'll get to that at the end of my talk today. Environmental Health Trust is a nonprofit that I created in order to educate communities and health professionals and develop sensible policies to reduce avoidable environmental health risks, and we are currently working on cell phones as our priority. Cell phones, in fact, are two-way microwave radios. How many of you uh, who have not read my book realize that a cell phone emits microwave radiation? How many of you knew that before today? Right. A very small number of people, okay? In fact, um, the cell phone and the microwave oven uh, operate um, at very similar frequencies. Now, the difference is that a microwave oven uses a thousand of, wa of watts of power and can boil a cup of water in one or two minutes. A cell phone uses less than one watt of power and is far too weak to cause the movement of molecules to resonate to boil water um, but we're using cell phones at the same frequency as a microwave oven for thousands of minutes a month and unfortunately thousands of hours a lifetime. And although the cell phone signal is too weak to cause anything like the ionizing damage that we get here from x-rays, it turns out that cell phone radiation does have biological effects contrary to the assumptions that guide much regulatory policies on cell phones today. Evidence for developing disease treatments, such as those given at this wonderful hospital, are based on animal studies, toxicology, and human studies. We look at animals, we study how they respond to things, such as a deficiency of vitamin D, and we see what can happen if, if we give them more vitamin D with respect to controlled studies that tell us, well, it looks like vitamin D is an important determinant of health, which indeed it is. We then do trials in humans or observations in humans, depending on the circumstances, and we conclude, as in recently we have with respect to vitamin D, that there are some real benefits to be obtained from ensuring that people get adequate amounts of vitamin D among other nutrients. So that's how we develop disease treatments. But when it comes to identifying the causes of disease, we take that same evidence, namely toxicology and, and human studies, and the debate has often been turned on its head. The debate is usually framed, do we have statistically significant proof of damage to humans yet? And if we do, then we conclude that there is a harmful relationship. Well, unfortunately, epidemiology is a study of patterns of disease in time and space is suited to telling you about the past, not the future. That's our dilemma. Epidemiologists look at populations that have been exposed or case control designs telling you about past exposures and current disease state for the most part. Um, I will explain why, of course, we can't rely on epidemiology when it comes to cell phone policy. 
um, given the fact that we have 100% saturation at this point. And since we can't always conduct human studies and it's unethical to conduct experiments on people, we have to look at models and measurements of exposure along with toxicology and case studies to fill the knowledge gaps. So I'm going to talk with you today about models and measurements and toxicology and give you a few comments about epidemiology at the end and I'm sure my colleagues will provide more insight from that at the end. Let's just look at the models we have of the brain. Um, these images are taken from work originally done for the cell phone industry by Professor Om Gandhi, with whom I am now collaborating uh, to develop further refined models of brain absorption of microwave radiation from cell phones. Now, you can't see here very clearly, but this is the head of a five-year-old, and the cell phone radiation pretty much gets about three-fourths of the way through the brain of a five-year-old. Uh, this is the brain of a 10-year-old, and this is that of an adult. Um, now, actually, this isn't an ordinary adult. This is a, an adult that goes by the name of SAM. SAM stands for Standard Anthropomorphic Mannequin. And Sam was about 6 feet 2, weighed about 220 pounds, and had an 11 to 12 pound head. I think there may be one or two people in this room with a head of that size, but the majority of you is much smaller than Sam. This is why, by the way, the Indian government has recently reissu reissued its recommendations about cell phone radiation as well, recognizing that most Indians uh, in India have much smaller heads and therefore will, will tend to absorb much more radiation than the standards have been set for. Now these standards were developed by Professor Gandhi, who as a service to the industry in the 1990s, evaluated phones. That was the, what his laboratory did. He was the chairman of the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Utah, and they developed the models for testing exposure to cell phone radiation. Um, he has parted ways with the cell phone industry because since the late 1990s, he's issued a series of papers, most recently some of which I've written with him, in which he says, look, we know cell phone radiation gets more deeply into the brain of children. It's foolish not to come up with protective policies that recognize that we need to protect children's brains because their exposures will be greater over a longer period of time and we do not know what the consequences of that will be. This is Sam in a, a different cross-sectional picture and these data were provided recently by the Cell Phone Industries Institute in Switzerland, Niels Kuster and his team. And what this shows you is that the estimated absorption of the cell phone into the brain of Sam, and you can see here this big sort of bowling ball size head, as opposed to, again, this younger child. And interestingly, these tests are conducted with a 10 millimeter or 15 millimeter spacer. Every millimeter away from the brain reduces the exposure to microwave radiation by 15 percent, right? So this spacer actually will substantially reduce the estimate of radiation. But the most important thing here to realize is that there's larger areas of exposure and greater average exposure into the young versus this big heavy set guy. Now, I'm going to talk to you now about some of the toxicology. The blood-brain barrier is a very interesting phenomenon that's been well studied um, for, for almost half a century now. The original work was done in Russia and subsequently then in the Office of Naval Research, and I talk about this in my book, Disconnect, where um, a curious researcher decided to inject animals with a fluorescent dye and noted that if you sacrifice the animal after the injection of dye, uh, the animal's brain did not turn colors, but the rest of the body did. This was evidence that the brain has a protective barrier that shields it from absorbing things from the bloodstream. Then in the early 1960s, um, Alan Frey, working for the Office of Naval Research, got the idea to study pulsed digital signals from microwave. Remember, this is before cell phones ever existed. His research showed that if you exposed an animal after injecting the dye, exposed the animal to a pulsed digital signal microwave, that the animal's brain turned a fluorescent color. Um, 
after, the year after he did that research, he was visited by his supervisor in his annual review, and he was told, you know, this is really interesting research, and if you want to continue working here, you're going to stop it. And he, and he did, until releasing his data and files to me when I was preparing my book. Because later on, other researchers, who I'm going to show you here in Greece, have done other work on the blood-brain barrier. And not only have they worked on the blood-brain barrier, and I'll show you this in a moment, uh, but they've also done work on memory and learning deficits and cranial and postcranial skeletal variations. I'm just going to concentrate right here on, you can see this nice, healthy, intact cell, and this is one that has been exposed to a pulsed digital signal like those from a cell phone. And this is a model, again, these are data developed by um, Greek researchers with whom I'm going to be meeting uh, in Istanbul in um, late May. Um, and they have shown that you can disrupt the blood-brain barrier significantly with exposure to uh, cell phone-like radiation, and this is 900 megahertz and 1800 megahertz. And, um, the disruption is basically about, about twofold. Now, why is that important? Well, the brain needs protection. We don't want the brain to be absorbing more pollutants. So think about this in terms of your own exposures living in the modern world. You can't avoid toxic pollutants. It's part of the price of society, of, of success, so to speak. But if you're constantly being exposed for hours a day to this kind of uh, exposure, you may be uptaking more pollutants. Interestingly, the work was originally done by a neurosurgeon, Life Salford, at Lund, and his work was directed to the following problem. He was trying to treat people with brain cancer. He wanted to be able to deliver chemotherapy agents into the brain, and because the brain naturally does not take things into it, he was having difficulty, and he hit upon the idea of using a pulsed digital signal to enhance uptake into the brain. It worked. It works as a way to enhance uptake of chemotherapy agents into the brain. Well, if it enhances the intake of chemotherapy agents, it also is going to enhance the intake of other agents. Other studies have been done with uh, pregnant animals, and this is again from the Wheeler Group, um, and this has been published in um, the peer-reviewed literature. Several different publications have shown effects of 1800 megahertz, which is the 2G signals, on uh, DNA damage and lipid damage in both pregnant and non-pregnant uh, rabbits. And basically, you can show increased DNA damage in adult rabbit brain after 15 minutes a day for seven days. 15 minutes a day for seven days. Um, these effects here, um, you can see the control and the exposed in the different groups. And these are somewhat technical slides for public talk, and I'm not going to go into the details here except to say that what this is making clear is that we're getting significant effects on DNA. And as everyone knows, DNA is the basic building block of all cellular material. It's in the nucleus of all of our cells is our DNA. And our DNA is why we're here today, because even if we've had damage, our DNA, when it's healthy, repairs that damage. It tells cells to stay in line. It sends proteins out to fix damage that has occurred. And this is showing that seven days exposure to 15 minutes a day with a pregnant um, and non-pregnant animals, um, and these are the two control groups, gives you a significant increase in various measures of DNA damage. Um, so I think it's very important to note um, that we have different measures in animals showing damage to DNA, showing the formation of free radicals and things that we know predict cancer risk. That's what we have experimentally. And when I say we, however, I should be very clear. The United States today has no active research underway on cell phone radiation and human health, and only one major project underway at the National Toxicology Program on animal health, and that study was recommended by the National Toxicology Program Board of Counselors, which I used to be a member of, in 1999. In 1999, and the study started in 2010. Right? So we've had a disconnect 
in the United States, in Canada, and a number of countries, between what some scientists have warned about and the way we have been treating cell phones as these benign devices. This is further work on DNA-based modifications, this time looking at white rabbits, not the real white rabbits, not Alice in Wonderland. And interestingly, uh, you get um, a, a, um, increased effects in, the, in some groups, uh, and this is looking at 8-hydroxyguanine addicts, but you don't have it in, in, under all circumstances. So 8-hydroxyguanine addicts, you don't see much of an effect, but here you see effects on DNA-based modification. Other studies have looked at cell death, apoptosis, at the brain and eye tissue of adult and pregnant rabbits and their newborns. And again, only one week of exposure. Now, let's be fair, rabbits don't live that long, right? A week in a rabbit's life corresponds to uh, years in ours. But we use the rabbit model to study the brain and the eye because it's been well um, developed and validated. Other studies have found hypothyroidism, basically shrunken thyroid and apoptotic bodies, cell death, occurring in the thyroid after 20 minutes a day for three weeks. And here are some of the slides showing the follicular unit of the thyroid gland and cells forming in the follicular wall. So you're seeing clear evidence of apoptotic changes right, right up here after exposure to cell phone radiation. Uh, these photomicrographs um, also show some immunoreactivity in the thyroid samples. This is the control, and this is the exposed, right? So there's positive immunoreactivity in the interstitial connective tissue, which is a fancy way of saying that cell phone radiation is interfering with the thyroid, which is, of course, the body's policeman. The thyroid regulates temperature, metabolism, hormones, a lot of essential processes. And it's looking like cell phone radiation can interfere with that. Now, just as a reminder of the context, identical twins, which are as close to we, as we have to um, clones in human nature, start out with pretty much identical chromosome bands. These are twins that come from one egg that splits in two, right? And these are the chromosomal bands of identical twins at age three. And this uh, fluorescent pattern here shows you hypo and hypermethylation, but it's simply an indication of the activities of certain genes and methylation patterns of those genes and chromosome, these, these chromosomal bands. They look pretty close to identical at age three. But by age 50, they don't even look like they're related to one another. They don't even look related to one another. Chroma, look at 1 and 17, even 12. Now, what is that telling us? These start out with, from the same egg that splits in two, right? After 50 years of life, they don't even look like they're related to one another. This is a clear sign. We know that genes give us the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. It's the gene-environment interaction that really determines most of health and disease patterns today. We know this as well from epidemiologic studies that have been done in Scandinavia where they have uh, followed people throughout their lifetimes and looking at twins in Scandinavia, even identical twins do not get the same cancer except 27% of the time. And they have concluded, therefore, that three out of every four cases of cancer is an environmentally determined cancer. Now, the environment doesn't mean chemicals. It means anything exogenous to the body with which you interact over your lifetime that affects the chances that you will get a disease. Environmental factors play a major role in determining breast cancer risk, although we don't fully understand what many of those environmental factors are. So another reason why the environment is known to be a cause of cancer is, of course, looking at other studies in epidemiology. We know that children who are adopted, again from studies in Scandinavia, develop the risk of their adopted family in which they grow up and not that of the family into which they were born from following registries of people. We also know, again, the identical twins do not get the same cancer, and that people who move from, Finland, from Asia to Finland or from Mexico to the United States 
or Asia to the United States tend to develop the cancer risk of their new countries. We also know that workers with certain occupational exposures have higher rates than those without those exposures, again, all pointing to the importance of environmental factors broadly conceived. Patterns are unexplained. Well, now I want to show you an unusual new risk factor that we need to pay attention to. Now, risk factors, like all things in epidemiology, are identified after the fact. So I'm showing you a potential risk factor, not one that's been confirmed. But I'm showing it to you because I'm working now with some breast surgeons around the world to promote awareness of this potential hazard and to prevent it. How many of you have know or have seen young women with their cell phones in their bras? All right. it's, it's actually quite common. In fact, among very young teenage girls, being able to put a cell phone in their bra is considered a rite of passage, like they've grown up enough that they can put a cell phone in their bra. It's not a good idea. And I'm going to show you one example now, because of course, remember, I said that cell phones are microwave radios. Microwaves work by heating water and liquid. The breast is mostly fat and fluid. It doesn't have the skull of the brain or the bone of the hip to protect it. So there is no way it's a good idea to put a phone in a bra with, uh, next to that fatty fluid tissue. This woman contacted me uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, she's uh, from California, and as you can see from her torso, she's a healthy, well-developed woman. Uh, she had three children before age 30. She was a vegetarian. She's Asian-American. That means she has about a third of the risk of developing breast cancer compared to a white American woman. But she did keep her cell phone in her bra. And this is where her, one of her tumors developed. And this is where the others were found. She had multifocal tumors. Her doctors and I are now writing up this as a case report, but I wanted to share this with you here because I think it's sufficiently unusual that I believe it provides a sentinel case of which the surgical community, the public health community, needs to be aware. It's quite unprecedented. The normal site for breast tumors, Dr. Axelrod, is where? The typical site. Upper outer quadrant. That means, you know, here or here. This is the upper inner quadrant. It's a quite unusual site, and it's quite unusual to have multifocal tumors. And we have the MRIs and the CAT scans as well. We're, I, I'm hoping you're going to help me extract them so that we can present this uh, as a case. I'm working on this with uh, Shauna Willey and John West and some of your colleagues. And I think that it would be important to ask this question if you have any unusual presentations of, uh, of breast tumors right now. Now I want to turn to another impact of cell phone radiation that somehow the media hasn't reported on. And that is the fact that sperm are reduced and damaged by cell phone radiation. What I'm showing you here today are studies done in Australia at the National Center of Biotechnology by Sir John Aitken, a Cambridge University trained expert in male reproductive health. But the study design that I'm going to describe has been used as well at the Cleveland Clinic, at the University of Athens, and at the major national hospital in, in Turkey, where I will be collaborating with people um, next month. And what they did was the following. They took samples of sperm from healthy men and divided them into two. The control sample is here. Now, you know, in order to make a healthy baby, a man needs to produce a half a billion sperm at a time. That's the ideal. They say the reason you need so many sperm is that they don't know how to ask for directions. <laughs> but in fact, sperm really do have a difficult job. If a sperm were human, a sperm to survive has to swim the equivalent of from Los Angeles to Hawaii. It's, it's a very uh, tough job. It's a hostile environment. So to, in order to make a healthy baby, you need healthy sperm. What Aiken's group and all the other four groups have done, so this is replicated independently in independent labs, 
is to take samples of sperm from men who've gone to, to clinics, and one sample gets exposed and one sample does not get exposed from the same person. And the average count of sperm is then maintained. This is the count of sperm, and you can see that exposed sperm are basically three times less than unexposed. So cell phone radiation causes three times more damage to exposed sperm, and this is a measure of how well they swim, motility. This is a measure of damage on the sperm, something called mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial are kind of the engine of the sperm that makes them able to swim. And this is showing you that the control sperm have um, basically a fourth less damage than do the exposed sperm. And again, these data have been replicated, and they're now in the forthcoming edition of Stan Glantz's new biostatistics textbook, because he looked at the data set and he thought they were so extraordinary that they could tell you some interesting things about power and how we can study things. And again, I think it's a very important indication of the biological impact of cell phone radiation. This is a study from the Cleveland Clinic where they looked at men. This is a very interesting observational study. This was the clinic on infertility. And the director of the clinic, Ashok Agarwal, who is uh, one of the most distinguished researchers in the United States in this field, noticed something interesting, that men who were having trouble making healthy babies often would walk in with two or three of these devices on their hips. Two, you know, two cell phone, Blackberry, iPhone, pager, whatever. So he began to just do a questionnaire and ask them how many hours a day did they use a cell phone. And what he was able to show, first of all, 20% of his sample used a cell phone for four hours a day. 20%. And of those who used the cell phone the most, they had about 40% less sperm than those who used it the least. So this was a pretty stunning observation, and again, this same observation has been replicated in a number of different places. Those of you who have your phones in your pocket now might want to really turn them off instead of just putting them on silent. Now, when it comes to understanding what's going on here, I have to confess, just as I, frankly, did not want to believe and was quite skeptical that cell phones could have any damaging effect on my health, uh, there's an unfortunate um, familiarity to the theme that runs through the science here. How many of you have seen the movie Thank You for Smoking? Right. It's really a good movie, so I kind of recommend it. And it's the, the movie, since most of you haven't seen it, I'll take a minute and describe it. The movie basically is about a guy who has a difficult job. He has to sell people on smoking. So once a week for social support, he meets with his colleagues who are selling alcohol and guns. And they get together, they call themselves the Merchants of Death or the Mod Squad. And they compare notes about how hard it is to get people to, you know, to engage in these somewhat questionable habits. Well, at the end of the movie, there's a new recruit. And there's three guys in suits, and they look a little uncomfortable. And off camera, the voice says, well, is it true? Do cell phones cause cancer? And they all begin to speak at the same time, and they say, well, we don't know, we're not sure, it, 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 it depends. And he says, gentlemen, practice these words in front of the mirror. Although we are constantly exploring the subject, currently there is no direct evidence that links cell phone usage to brain cancer. No direct evidence. Well, now let me tell you something. That statement is true. But it's true because of the limitations of the evidence that we've gathered and because of the difficulties that we face in our failure to monitor. The United States today is not conducting any serious epidemiologic investigation of this question in humans. The United States did not participate in the only international study ever conducted on this topic at the World Health Organization, did not participate. The last study on this topic in the United States was published in 2002. 2002. There is no active research program underway on this question at all. The presumption has been it's impossible. It's physically impossible because after all, everyone knows cell phone radiation cannot have any biological effect. 
Well, I believed that also, but I don't any longer. Let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology, and then we'll turn it over to my colleagues. When the atom bombs fell at the end of World War II, the sickest and most exposed people died right away. And there was no increase in brain tumors in survivors. Now, the atom bomb was a massive release of ionizing radiation, not non-ionizing radiation. But there was no increase in brain cancers associated with it until 40 years later. It took 40 years until the general population of survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki were able to show any increase in brain cancer. So the fact that we do not have a general increase in brain cancer at this time, and we do not, is to be expected, given that the increase in use of cell phone radiation is really recent in almost all countries. Most epidemiologic studies of cell phones do not increase brain cancer. There's no evidence in most studies of any increased risk, except after 10 years of heavy use. And my postdoc and I did studies on acoustic neuroma. There have been other investigations as well. But it takes 10 years in case control design where you, for you to see any increase in risk. Now, I want to show you a very unusual tumor. Any docs here ever seen a malignant parotid gland tumor? It's very rare and typically occurs in people who've chewed tobacco. It's a tumor that occurs right here, right where cell phones are. And we are seeing an increase in this tumor in young people. I'm writing up a case report of a young woman in Idaho who slept with her phone and was on it for six to eight hours a day when her husband was in Iraq for four tours of duty and started using her cell phone at age 17 and developed a malignant parotid gland tumor at age 24. The Israeli Dental Association has issued a warning because one in every five of this rare malignant tumors is now occurring in Israel in someone under the age of 20. And they're advising young people to limit their exposure because the Israeli epidemiologist, led by Sigal Sadetsky, a highly respected member of the WHO research team, has found a doubled or greater risk with long-term use of cell phones. This is the increase in parotid gland tumors over the last 30 years, and you see here the recent increase that has led the Israeli Dental Association uh, to be concerned. But I want to make sure you understand, this is number of cases, this is not rates, but nonetheless, the rate has basically tripled, and the number of cases has gone up even more. Well, some people are concerned about cell phone radiation, and they say, you know, it affects the brain, so let's just keep it away, and it's become the subject of cartoons. But the Volkhoff study in the Journal of the American Medical Association recently, and it's just got X'd out here, so let me go back and find it for you. Here. This is what Volkow showed in this study. They got IRB approval to do PET scans on healthy people, which I thought was kind of interesting. And a PET scan is a, a, involves a massive amount of radiation in order to image what's going on inside the brain, and you can see metabolically what's going on. And they injected uh, these people with a dye that would show you where the glucose patterns were most pronounced. And what they did was to take the same person and give that person a PET scan one day, and then the next day expose them to cell phone radiation simply by turning on a phone they didn't talk at all. So they had no way to know what the phone was on or not. It was simply next to the brain, and it was either on or off. And what they showed was a significant increase in glucose metabolism after just 50 minutes of having the phone next to the brain. Five zero minutes significantly alters glucose metabolism. Well, your glucose metabolism is being altered right now if you're not asleep and you're listening to me. Because you need glucose for the brain to work. It's the brain's fuel. The question is, what is the consequence 
over many years of having elevated glucose because you're holding a cell phone next to your head. And what is the consequence for our children and my grandchildren of that kind of exposure? Now, Dr. O. Volkoff herself is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And she has issued advice that it's prudent to take precautions now because her work clearly shows that contrary to the assumptions that guide all public policies on cell phones today, cell phone radiation clearly has a significant biological effect. The question is, what does it mean? I mean, after all, we need glucose in the brain, but too much, too much glucose is associated with infections in diabetics, and uh, as well as a whole host of other issues. Finnish authorities looking at other evidence over a period of years have issued these advisories. That people should text rather than call, they should use hands-free devices, they should keep phones away from the body. And that actually, that advice is what the cell phone industry says. How many of you know that the Blackberry comes with a warning that tells you how safely to hold it? Two people in this room. Okay. Well, let me, I will show you those in a moment. This is what Lyon posted on its bulletin public billboards in 2008. The portable avant deux ans say no. Portable phone before age 12, no way. And that advice has been echoed by a number of other nations as well. The French government has issued these restrictions so that it is illegal to design or market a cell phone for a young child in France. While we are expanding that marketing right now, how many of you know infants that are given phones to play with? Real phones. And you can download apps of white noise for babies to fall asleep to the sound of waves and trees, and even apps for babies to learn or children to learn how to draw. Now, I actually don't think those are all bad, providing you disconnect from the wireless. If you want to give your child an electronic toy, that's up to you. But don't give them a phone that's connected to the wireless to play with. That's, I think, not a good idea. And that advice is advice that Environmental Health Trust gives, the Finnish, the French, and the Israeli governments give as well. President Bush's cancer panel in 2010 issued this report that long-term monitoring and quantification of electromagnetic energy exposures to cell phones and wireless technologies are urgently needed. And yet we are not carrying out such monitoring now. But I'm delighted to see some colleagues here from epidemiology at this institution, and I'm hoping that we may be able to come up with some studies that can be done, because there's really clearly a need for such studies to be developed. How to protect your family. This is the advice that you can find in some of the handouts that have been copied, and I want to thank Danielle and the staff at NYU for making them available. Use a speakerphone. Use an earpiece. Do not keep the phone on the body. Avoid using it in areas where the signal's weak. You know what happens when your phone signal is weak? You run out of battery power, right? The reason you run out of battery power is because the phone is trying to get the signal from the tower. It's using more energy, and half of the energy from the phone will get into your brain or body if it's held right next to your brain or body. That's why you only want to use it in areas of weak signals if it's a true emergency. And of course, limit children's use of phones. These precautions can also be found on the FCC and FDA and ACS websites, but they say, there's really no reason to take precautions, but if you want to reduce your exposure, here's how you can do it. I beg to differ. I think there are reasons to take precautions, and those reasons I have been identified in my book and are also on the websites of the British government, which just issued a statement from the Department of Health reiterating their advice that children under the age of 16 use cell phones only for emergencies. Now, the fine print warnings. Um, I know you can't read either, any of that, but that's the size of the warnings that come with the iPhone. And those of you in the front can read it. The iPhone 4 
SAR measurement, the specific absorption rate in that big guy brain, may exceed the FCC exposure guidelines for body-worn operation if positioned less than 15 millimeters, 5 eighths of an inch from the body, e.g. when carrying the iPhone in your pocket. Where else is a man supposed to carry his phone? In fact, if you were to test phones <clears throat> in the breast pocket or the pants pocket, the estimated specific absorption rate would be four to eight times greater than that that it is when tested in the holster. So we've got a problem here. And blackberries <clears throat> come with advice that if you have a pacemaker, hold it about eight inches away and don't carry it in your breast pocket. Well, in fact, pacemakers come with shields around them before they're implanted in your chest. They are protected from exogenous factors. But the rest of us don't have that protection around our hearts. So we've started the campaign for safer cell phones. With warning labels for cell phones and some of our stickers, I'll show you in a moment, can be obtained out at the front desk. And we're working with schools and parents and teachers around the country to promote this issue of safer cell phone use. We're looking for models, no experience necessary, must be willing to protect their brains and practice safe phone. We've got videos and other things to promote the idea of safe phone. Se cell phones save lives and have revolutionized economies, but we have to be sensible at how we use them. So Environmental Health Trust is now work working with communities in this country, in Canada, and around the world to promote safe phone practices. We're expanding a business campaign for safer cell phones nationwide, and we're expanding our scientific research program, working with researchers in Israel and Turkey and Brazil uh, to improve our understanding of the brain and to conduct high-impact experimental studies and improve our understanding of these unusual events that appear to be associated with cell phone use, such as multifocal breast cancer for women who've kept the phone in their bras. We have five cases so far. Um, the stickers, just to show you a few of them. <clears throat> My favorite is the one with Einstein. Can't call it a smartphone if it kills brain cells. <clears throat> the idea is that these stickers are to get your attention, make people think about the fact that cell phones are microwave emitting devices and should be used carefully. These are some of the stickers. Cell phones should have some warnings with them. And in fact, the fine print warnings that I showed you are in the packaging that you see after you buy the phone. But in San Francisco, there's a proposal to make these warnings available before you buy the phone. And the industry is fighting, claiming it interferes with their First Amendment rights. Really, that's what they're saying. It's okay for us to tell you after you buy the phone about safe use, but you can't force us to tell you before. This is a poster developed by our colleagues in UK uh, with our Save the Mail campaign. This is going in um, men's bathrooms. It says, your future is in your hands. Medical experts are warning men not to keep their mobile phones in their pockets, as this can have a direct effect on their fertility. So practice safe phone. Information about that can be obtained from all of the handouts and, of course, from our book. Remember that even when you're sleeping, your cell phone isn't. And so put your phone on airplane mode or do something really radical and turn it off. Certainly don't sleep with it near your head. And I leave you with this quote from Albert Einstein. The world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything at all. Thank you very much.